ladies and gentlemen, at this time, both sides are going to have the opportunity to present an opening statement, and pursuant to the rules of procedure, the state goes first. Still, may we have a brief side fight? Okay. All right, state whenever you're ready. Thank you, Your Honor. Good, uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to speak to you about the unspeakable, about this defendant's goal-directed, planned, systematic murder, mass murder, of 14 children an athletic director, a teacher, and a coach. These brutal murders occurred at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in Parkland, Florida, and it happened on February the 14th, 2018, three days before these brutal murder, this massacre, the defendant in this case made a cell phone video on his cell phone. And this is what the defendant said. Hello, my name is Nick. I'm going to be the next school shooter of 2018. My goal is at least 20 people with an AR-15 and some tracer rounds. It's going to be a big event. And when you see me on the news, you'll know who I am. You're all going to die. Ah, yeah, I can't wait. Ah, yeah, I can't wait. Cold, calculated, manipulative, and deadly. Now, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School is located at 5901 Pine Island Road in Parkland, Florida. It's bordered by Hamburg Road, on the north side, the Sawgrass Expressway on the south side, Pine Island Road on the east side, and on the west side is Carl Ridge Drive. But if you, and you'll see a map, before you get to Carl Ridge Drive to the west, there's uh, West Glades Middle School and then a Walmart, and then there's Carl Ridge Drive. You'll see that Marjorie Stoneman High School kind of resembles a college campus. Uh, there's, there was approximately 13 buildings spread out over the campus. Uh, most of the buildings were one and two story buildings, except for one. The one building that is not a one or two story building is a three story building, and it's known as the 1200 building or the freshman building. The 1200 building is located on the northeast side of the campus. 
So it's bordered on the north by uh, Homburg Road and Pine Island on the east. It's a three-story building, and there's two entrances to the 1200 building. There's an entrance on the east side, and there's an entrance on the west side. And both those east and west entrances open up to the first floor hallway. Uh, the entrances are a double door on the east side and a double door on the west side. And to the right of those double doors, there's a secondary door, both on the east side and on the west side. And this secondary door leads up into the uh, first floor landing of the stairwell. And the stairwells go up to the third floor, both on the east side and on, uh, on the west side. There are 10 classrooms on each floor of the 1200 building. There are six classrooms on the south side of the hall. There's four classrooms on the north side of the hall, and that holds true for the first floor, second floor, and the third floor. And Marjorie Stoneman Douglas, back on February the 14th, 2018, had a surveillance system, and there are approximately 76 cameras that spread out through the campus. And these cameras were motion activated. And what that means is they don't, they have to detect motion before they record. So if there's nothing moving, they, they don't record. In the 1200 building, there were 13 cameras. There were three cameras on the first floor, three cameras on the second floor, and three cameras on the third floor. And these cameras are installed in the ceiling. So there is a, uh, a camera on the east side in the ceiling, a camera in the center in the ceiling, and a camera on the west in the ceiling, three cameras, and there's three cameras just like that in the ceilings on the first floor, second floor, and third floor. The camera on the east side, up on the ceiling, focuses west. The camera in the center of the ceiling focuses west. The camera on the west side focuses east, and that's true for the first floor, second floor, and the third floor. And there are two additional cameras in each stairwell. There's one on the third floor of the stairwell, one on the second floor of the stairwell, and that's true for the west stairwell and the east stairwell. There are 13 cameras in the 1200 building. There are no cameras in the classrooms. There are no cameras in the classrooms. And again, these cameras are motion activated. So you will see a surveillance video from the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School from uh, February the 14th, 2018. You will see the defendant on the first floor fire a rifle, shoot and kill nine students, the athletic director, and a coach. And the athletic director and the coach were both campus monitors. You will see the defendant fire his rifle six times on the second floor. And you will see him shoot and kill five students on the third floor and a teacher on the third floor. You will see him wound 13 other students on the first floor. And you'll see him wound three other students on the third floor, and wounding of a teacher. You will not see every single second of that surveillance video. You're going to say, why? Because it's what? It's motion activated. When the defendant fired his rifle, the percussion in the hallway was so loud that it caused the ceiling tile, the dust from the ceiling tile, to fall down. And when the dust from the ceiling, and it looks like smoke, and when it comes down, it prevented the cameras from detecting some of the motion of the defendant. But most of it is there, and you will see it. The cameras are motion activated. You will also learn that because of the percussion of the defendant firing his rifle, it also affected the fire alarm system. So at 2.22.38, and I'll get back to why that time is important, this fire alarm goes off.
because the fire alarm system was not able to detect the difference between what? Between smoke and dust. The defendant attended Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School from February, uh, from uh, August the 15th, 2015 to February the 8th, 2017, and he was also a member of the JROTC. Let me take you back to uh, Valentine's Day, February the 14th, 2018. A Uber stops in front of the east gate to Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School. It's a pedestrian gate on the east side on Pine Island Road. It's a female Uber driver. Uh, the defendant gets out of the seat, the rear seat of the Uber, I think it was a RAV4, and he gets out and he's carrying a black case and a backpack. Now, school's in session. It's Wednesday, February the 14th, 2018. It's approximately 2.19 p.m. The school starts at 7.40 a.m., Marjorie Stone tells us, and the last class ends at 2.40. A short, the gates open for, in the morning for the students to enter and go to class, and then they close. And then they open again, so uh, right before uh, school ends at 2.40, 20 or 30 minutes before. So what? The students uh, can leave, leave the campus. So it's 2.19 p.m. The defendant is carrying a black case and a, back back, a, a backpack. And what he has in this case, what he has in this case is a Smith & Wesson 5.56 caliber Rifle, and this rifle, basically, it's commonly known as an AR-15. This rifle uh, fires not only 5.56 caliber ammunition, but also fires .223 caliber ammunition. The gun will fire both. This gun uh, is commonly known as a Semi uh, as an AR-15, it's a semi-automatic rifle. This weapon will fire as many bullets as it contains in the firearm magazine. And this is the way this 5.6 Smith & Wesson M&P-15 TF 16214 is the serial number. This is the way this gun operates. What you do is you load the firearm magazine with bullets. And the bullet is about like this for a 5.56 and a 223. And you put those bullets in the magazine, you load them in the magazine. And the, the magazine, the bullets will go in as many as the magazine will hold. So if it's a 40 round magazine, you can stick in 40 bullets. If it's a 30 round magazine, you can stick in 30 bullets. So you fill up the magazine, and then you take the magazine and with how many bullets you have in it, and you stick it into uh, the magazine well of the rifle. And then you pull back the lever, and you charge a bullet that goes into the firing chamber, and you pull the trigger. This weapon will fire as quickly as you can pull the trigger. And that's what the defendant had. And the Uber driver picked up the defendant to bring him to Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School from 7200 Loxahatchee Road. 72 Loxahatchee Road was the home of Kimberly and James Sneed and their son, J.T. Sneed. J.T. Sneed was a friend of the defendants. They both went to Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High Douglas High School together. They were both a member of the JROTC uh, together. And a short time after Thanksgiving of 2017, the defendant came to live with the Sneeds. He had his own bedroom. Uh, he <coughs> was attending school. He was working at the Dollar Tree. The Sneeds 
took the defendant in and offered him a place to live. Why? The defendant's adopted mother passed away November 1st, 2017. The defendant needed a place to live. The Sneeds made the offer. The defendant moved in with them. And it was a short time after Thanksgiving. These murders happened when? February the 14th, 2000. And 18. On this particular, and when the defendant <laughs> arrived at Marjorie Stoneman High School on uh, Wednesday, February the 14th, 2018, he had been planning to be a school shooter long before he moved in with the Sneeds and long before his mother passed away. On this particular Wednesday, on this particular Valentine's Day, the defendant gets out of the Uber. He goes through the passenger gate. He's wearing his backpack. He's carrying his black case. It was a black Cabela bag case with a rifle in it. And he walks about 360 feet from, the, from Pine Island Road to the east entrance double doors. He walks in through the east double doors, makes an immediate right-hand turn, and walks in to the bottom floor of the stairwell, of the east stairwell. He takes his rifle out of the Cabela bag, black bag, and as he's preparing his rifle to fire, in walks a student, Christopher McKenna. Christopher, Christopher McKenna was a student in classroom 1216. 1216 is on the first floor. It's the second classroom from the east double door entrances. Christopher McKenna was out on the bathroom pass, and he was going up to the second floor because at the time, the first floor restrooms and the third floor restrooms uh, were, were, were locked. And so the security could watch people go to the second floor because they were concerned about, you know, different activities in the first floor and third floor, kids going there, vaping or hiding out or whatever. So for a security measure, they did lock the bathroom doors on the first floor and the third floor. So Christopher McKenna gets a pass from his teacher. Uh, it was Miss Haas in 1216. She taught English, approximately 30 students in her class. He get his, gets his pass, walks down the hall, bumps into a couple of kids, and you'll see the video of him uh, bumping fists with uh, two of the, the students, and he walks into the stairwell as the defendant, Nicholas Cruz, is preparing his, his M&P 15 rifle. And he said, the defendant says to Christopher McKenna, you better get out of here. Something bad is about to happen. Christopher McKenna runs out they remember I described the secondary door that's in, to, in the stairwell. He runs out that east door, and he runs to find a campus monitor. When he runs out, the defendant enters the first floor hallway. And when he enters the first floor hallway, there are four students in the hallway. He gets out, and he fires his weapon at the four students in the hallway. The time... 221.33. 221.33. The massacre begins. Here's who the four students were in the first floor hallway. <clears throat> Ashley Bias was walking west in the hallway in, in front of classroom 1215. And let me describe. In what existed on the south side. You know, there's six classrooms on the south side. So the first classroom on the south side is 1218. The next class, the numbers aren't, you know, consistent, but the next classroom is 1215, classroom 1215. So sitting in front of classroom 1215 is a student, Gina Montalto, and she asked permission from the teacher in 1215, by the way, it was a personalization class, so you can catch up on your homework and do different things, different from when I went to school, but you can do whatever you want in homework, whatever, like a study hall. So she asked 
uh, Miss Matlock, if she could go out in the hall and work on her computer because it was more private and she could get more work done on her project. Miss Matlock had offered to her to go to a different classroom or somewhere else. Gina said, no, fine, I'd, I'd like to do that. So she's sitting, uh, and, you, and when you watch the video, you'll see her legs sticking out from classroom, from the front of classroom 1215. Standing next to her, knocking on the door to classroom 1215, was Mark Duque Aquiano and Luke Hoyer. Mark and Luke were coming back from, uh, and you can get permission to, to go to other classes. They were coming back from somewhere near the administration building. They had to do something. And you'll see them actually coming back uh, down the corridor and, and walking in. And you'll see him, uh, one of uh, Luke or, or Martin, uh, bump fists with Chris McKenna. So they're standing at uh, the door of classroom 1215 and they're knocking to get in because procedure is when class is in session, the classroom door is supposed to be locked. The defendant fires at Martin Duque Aquiano, Gina Montaldo, and Luke Hoyer. He then turns and goes over to classroom 1216. Remember I described that? That's where Christopher McKenna left from. That's Miss High's English class. Approximately 24 students in there. He fires into 1216. You'll see on all the doors in the 1200 building, there is a glass window in the metal door. And this window is approximately 8 inches wide and 42 inches long. The defendant fired through that window, shattering the window, and shooting and killing Alex Schachter, who was sitting in his desk. The defendant then turns right outside of classroom 1216. He kneels down. He takes off his backpack, unzips his backpack, and pulls out a black tactical vest. And you'll see the vest. This vest has pouches all over it, so you can stick firearm magazines in it. There were 10 firearm magazines in that black tactical vest. The defendant kneels, takes it out, puts the vest on, takes the uh, expended magazine out of the magazine well of the rifle, and puts in a new magazine. He stands up and he walks over to 1215, where Martin Duque and Luke Hoyer and Gina Montalda were, and he fires into them. And then he fires into classroom 1214. Remember I said there's 1218, and then there's 1215, and then there's 1214. And 1214 and 1215 are adjoining. Their doors are right next to one another. The defendant fires through the glass window and shatters it and fires into classroom 1215, uh, 1214. 1214 is a class that was being taught by Ivy Seamus. She was teaching Holocaust history. He fires in to 1214, and he shoots and kills Helena Ramsey. He shoots and kills Nicholas Dorette, and he wounds Samantha Grady, Samantha Fuentes, Isabel Checker, and Danielle Meniscule. He then turns away from 1214 and walks back across the hall to 1216. And he fires again through the shattered window in 1216. This time, he shoots and kills Alyssa Alphadeff. He shoots and kills Elena Petty. He wounds Justin Colton. He wounds William Olson. He wounds Genesis Valentin. He wounds Keshava Magaporian. And he wounds Alexander Dorette, the brother of Nicholas Dorette who was shot and killed across the hall in 1214. He then turns and walks away from 1216, and he's walking west. At this time, through the west double doors, comes running Christopher Hickson. Christopher Hickson 
was a <coughs> campus monitor and an athletic, uh, athletic director. He comes running through the west doors. The defendant sees him and fires his rifle at uh, Christopher Hickson. Christopher Hickson is hit. He's severely wounded. He falls to the ground and he crawls over to an alcove on the north side of the first floor hallway. The con defendant continues to walk west. And he's walking west. He passes Gina Montaldo, Martin K. Aquiano, and Lou Coyer again. And he fires into them again. Then he proceeds west. Now he goes to classroom 1213. 1213 is now the third classroom from the east side. You have 1217, 1216. Remember, he fired into 1216. Now this is 1213. 1213 is a psychology class being taught by Renette Reoven. And he does, the defendant, Nicholas Cruz, does this again. He fires through that window, shatters the glass, shoots and kills 16-year-old Carmen Chentrump. He wounds Madeline Wilford. He wounds Samantha Mayer. And he wounds Benjamin Wickander. He then turns and walks west again. And as he's walking west, he passes Christopher Hickson. And you'll see it. He turns like this and shoots Christopher Hickson again. He continues to walk west, the defendant does. And he reaches the west stairwell door entrance to the stairwell. And he walks into that door. And as he walks in that door, the door, the outside door, remember I said the secondary door, just like on the east side, on the west side, that door opens. And who is it? It's Coach, Coach Aaron Feist, who's also a campus monitor. Aaron Feist is the campus monitor that uh, Chris McKenna ran to find to tell him about what he saw. So here's Aaron Feist opening the door. And as the defendant is walking in the first floor stairwell, he turns and he fires his rifle and shoots and kills Aaron Feist. Aaron Feist is shot twice in the chest. He falls right outside the class, the, the, that west outside door. The door closes and he falls right outside that door. The defendant then goes up the west stairwell. And as he's going up the west stairwell, there are also, as I said, 10 classrooms on the second floor. Now, the teachers and the students, they heard the shots. And when the fire alarm goes off at 2.22.38, the procedure is to evacuate. Oh, uh -huh. no. They did evacuate. The defendant fired 70 shots on the first floor and two shots in the stairwell. So the teachers and students on the second floor they heard that. So they didn't follow the procedure of evacuating when there's a fire drill. They fired the procedure that if there's an active shooter, you get away from the door and you turn off the lights and you be quiet. And that's exactly what the students and teachers on the second floor did. So when the defendant gets up on the second floor, he looks in a couple of the classrooms and he fires in to uh, classroom 1234 and 1231, shatters the windows. So there was nobody in 1234 or 1231. He only fired, only fired. He fired six shots on the second floor. And he goes to the east side stairwell to go up to the third floor now. Now, the students on the te and the teachers on the third floor, they heard some this some noises, but they weren't distinct like the students and teachers heard on the second floor of the shots being fired. So they didn't hear like gunfire, they didn't hear shots. But what they did, they were responding to the fire drill. So the, the class is empty out, they follow the procedure, some go down the, are going to go down the west stairwell, some are going to go down the east stairwell, but when the, uh, the kids are doing that and they're going down the stairwell, then they hear the gunshots on the second floor. So what do they do? They race back up the east stairwell and the west stairwell. 
and they run as fast as they can to get back into their classrooms for safety. So when the defendant walks up the east stairwell, there's a teacher helping his students get in to his classroom. His name was Scott Beagle. He was 35 years old, and he was teaching geography in classroom 1256. 1256 is the first classroom uh, from the uh, east side on the north side of the hallway. He has the door open. The kids are going in. The defendant pops out of the east stairwell door and fires into uh, Scott Beagle four times, killing him. And he falls right in the entrance to his classroom. And next to uh, Scott Beagle's classroom is 1255 uh, uh, on the north side. And that classroom uh, was an English teacher, Stacy LaPelle. And she's hustling all the kids to get into her classroom. And she was successful in doing that. But as she's the last one there to close the door, the defendant shoots at her and wounds her. And she closes the door and goes back into her classroom. The defendant continues to fire on the third floor. He's firing from east to west. There are two girls, two students, Carol Logren and Meadow Pollock. They're in front of classroom 1249 on the south side of the hall. The defendant shoots both of them. And they fall and they go huddle into the alcove of classroom 1249. He fires and hits and wounds Kyle Lehman, Marin Kapachenko, and Anthony Borges. The other students are running away down the hall. They're running from the defendant. He shoots again, and he hits Joaquin Oliver, and Joaquin Oliver ran uh, into the alcove of the men's restroom. Uh, Jamie Guttenberg was racing down the hall to get to the stairwell door, and she was shot. Peter Wang, he was doing the same thing. He was running to the stairwell door to run down. Uh, they, he, was, he, he was shot. The defendant then proceeded west again. And as he passes classroom 1249, just as he did on the first floor when he went by uh, Gina Montaldo and Martin Duquet and Luke Hoyer and Christopher Hickson, he fires into Carol Logren and Meadow Pollock as they were huddled in the alcove of 1249. He then leaves and moves further west. He looks into uh, the alcove of the men's restroom where Joaquin Oliver was wounded. He was shot in the leg. He couldn't run. The defendant fires into and kills Joaquin Oliver. The defendant then turns and walks further down the hall. Jamie Guttenberg was able to reach the door, but she collapsed on the third floor stairwell, and that's where she died. She died on the third floor stairwell of that building. <clears throat> Peter Wang was shot, and he was lying in the southwest corner right in front of the west stairwell door. The defendant walks up to him, and fires in to Peter Wang again. Peter Wang was shot 13 times. The defendant then looks out this little window in the stairwell on the west side. He turns and he walks over to room 1240. Now 1240 is not a classroom. It's a teacher's lounge. And teachers go there, I guess, to papers or whatever they're doing, you lunch, whatever, there's desks in there, and there's a couple, there's a men's room and a ladies room in there, restrooms, and a couple other rooms attached once you go into the classroom, uh, to uh, the, the teacher's lounge, 1240. The defendant shoots the glass because 1240 had a glass just like all the other, you know, other rooms, the other classrooms, eight, eight inches wide, 42 inches long. He shoots through that window and he goes into 1240. Now, when you go into 1240, 
there's a window on the south side looking over the campus, and there's a window on the west side looking over the campus. And they look over a courtyard, they look over walkways, and they over, look over parking lots. The defendant fires his rifle through the at the west window, and you'll see there's five bullet holes in the west window, and he fires five shots out of the south window. He then leaves 1240. He passes the body of Peter Wang. He opens the west stairwell door. He passes the body of Jamie Guttenberg. He takes off his vest, lays it down on notes of the third floor landing stairwell, takes his rifle, lays it down, and he runs out. The defendant is wearing a maroon J-R-O-T-C Stoneman Douglas R-O-T-C shirt uh, that students get when they're members of the J-R-O-T-C. He's wearing black pants, he's wearing a dark blue baseball cap, he's wearing glasses. He runs down the west stairwell and he runs down and runs out of, of the door and he passes Aaron Feist. He leaves the 1200 building at 2.27.55. He started a shooting at 2.21.33. He leaves the 1200 building at 2.27.55. He runs west. Then he turns south and runs by the tennis courts. And he runs and blends in with students and teachers who were evacuating the campus. They were evacuating the campus because they heard the fire drill. When the fire alarm goes off, it goes off through the whole campus. So they were leaving. The defendant runs and gets in with the group, and they all go, this whole group of students and teachers, out to Hamburg Road on, uh, to the north. They pass West Glades at, uh, Middle School. They go out to Hamburg Road. The defendant gets to Hamburg Road. He, make, he goes west. He walks to Walmart, walks through the parking lot, goes into Walmart, goes into the Subway sandwich shop that's actually in Walmart. He orders an icy. He leaves a tip, pays for it, leaves a tip, takes his icy, walks out of the Subway, sits on a bench inside Walmart, drinks his icy, is there for a couple minutes, gets up, and he leaves. And he walks over to Carl Ridge Drive, and he walks south on Carl Ridge Drive, and he walks to a McDonald's on Carl Ridge Drive. He arrives at uh, the McDonald's at 3.01 p.m. And as he walks into the McDonald's, there's a student there named John Wilford. John Wilford was a, was a student at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas. He's sitting at one of the booths. He is the brother of Madeline Wilford, who was shot in classroom 1213. John had no idea what was going on. He certainly didn't know his sister was shot. He's calling, waiting for his mother to pick him up, as a lot of the students were, because they had evacuated. Uh, he's sitting at the booth. The defendant, Nicholas Cruz, walks up to him and sits across from him in the middle booth. And when you see the video, they're going to say, hey, they had to know each other. John Wilford didn't know him, and the defendant asked him for a ride. And John Wilford says, I'm not going to give you a ride. My mom's picking me up. Um, you know, she's going to pick me up. We can't give you a ride. So uh, John's mom arrives in the parking lot. John gets up. He leaves McDonald's. The defendant follows him. He goes with him. He says, hey, look, can you give me a ride? He says, look, I told you I'm not going to give you a ride. I'm going with my mom. So John gets in his mom's vehicle, they leave, the defendant crosses Carl Ridge Drive, and he walks into uh, an area called Wyndham Lakes. It's, it's a, a, a development. He's walking in with Wyndham Lakes, and uh, about this time, there's an officer uh, who's responding uh, to help other agencies. His name is Michael Leonard. He's a police officer with the Coconut Creek Police Department, and uh, he's looking for a white male uh, wearing a, a maroon JROTC, um, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas uh, 
collared uh, shirt, polo shirt, and black pants and a dark hat. So he sees uh, Nicholas Cruz walking uh, on uh, Wyndham Lake South. He pulls him over, stops him, uh, the police come, and he's arrested. The defendant is arrested at three, approximately 3.40 p.m. It, the location is approximately a, a mile and an eighth from McDonald's and 2.9 miles approximately from Marjorie Stoneman Douglas. The police and the medical examiner's office, after that, arrive at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas at the 1200 building. And this is what they find. There are 14 deceased bodies at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas at the 1200 building. There are another two bodies at the North District Hospital. They were Gina Montaldo, the little girl who was sitting outside with her computer outside 1215. They took her to the hospital. Gina was shot four times. She was 14 years old, and she died from her wounds. They also took Christopher McKenna, because um, not, uh, Christopher Hickson, the athletic director, who crawled over to the, to the north side of the wall in that <coughs> alcove. When the police came, he was still alive. Uh, they took him to the North District Hospital. Christopher Hickson, the athletic director, the campus monitor, was 49 years old. He was shot three times, and he died of his wounds. Martin Duque Aquiano is 14 years old. He was with Luke Hoyer uh, knocking on the classroom door of 1215 when the police came. They took him out, and they took him to Hamburg Road and Pine Island Road to see if they could help him. Martin Duque Aquiano was 14 years old. He was shot eight times, and he died of his wounds. And then when the medical examiner and the police came in, they saw Luke Hoyer. He had been moved by the police so students could get out of 1215, but Luke was still in, still in the hallway. Luke was 15 years old. He was shot twice, and he died of his wounds. They went over to classroom 1216. It was Miss Haas English class. Uh, sure enough, Alex Schachter, 14 years old, was shot twice in the chest, and he died of his wounds. Elena Alphadef, uh, Alyssa Alphadef, was 14 years old. She was in classroom 1216. She was shot eight times, and she died of her wounds. Elena Petty was in classroom 12, uh, 1216. She was shot four times, and she died of, of her wounds. They, the police and medical examiners then went across the hall to 1214, Ms. Seamus' class, who was teaching Holocaust history. Helena Ramsey was shot four times. 17 years old, she died of her wounds. wounds. Nicholas Dorette was shot three times in 1214. Was shot three times. He was 17 years old, and he died of his wounds. And they crossed the hall to classroom 1213. In 1213, it was Carmen Chintrum. Carmen Chintrum was 16 years old, and she was shot three times, and she died of her wounds. They then saw Aaron Feist, and Aaron Feist was still lying just outside the west stairwell door, just to the south of the double doors to the west entrance. Aaron Feist was shot twice in the chest, and he died of his wounds. The police had brought down, before the medical examiner got there, brought down um, Jamie Guttenberg from the third floor landing, and she was outside just to the north of the, the double doors on the west entrance. Jamie shot, was shot one time. Jamie was 14 years old, and she died of her wounds. There was no one that was shot and killed on the second floor, but on the third floor, the police found just outside his classroom, 1216, he was moved a little bit too, was Scott Beagle. Scott Beagle was the geography teacher who was hope, holding the door open for the students. Scott Beagle was 35 years old. He was shot four times, and he died of his wounds. Uh, further down the hall, uh, right in front of 1249, the police brought the bodies of Meadow Pollock and Carol Logren out to the middle of the hall so students could, could get out, you know, after this was all over. Meadow Pollock was 18 years old. She was shot six times, and she died of her wounds. 
Tara Longren was 14 years old. She was shot three times, and she died of her wounds. They found uh, Joaquin Oliver. Joaquin Oliver was the, the boy who was shot in, in the alcove of the men's restroom on the third floor. The police had pulled his body out into the middle of the hallway, too. Um, Joaquin was 17 years old. He was shot four times, and he died of his wounds. Just to the west, still lying there in the southwest portion of the hall, uh, by the west uh, stairwell door, was Peter Wang. Peter Wang was shot 13 times, and Peter uh, died of his, of, of his wounds. Uh, the BSO crime scene unit came, and they did uh, their, their investigation. Here's what they found. Uh, there were 139 rounds fired in the 1200 building. There were seven rounds fired on the first floor. There were two, round, uh, two, two rounds fired in the west stairwell. Remember when uh, the defendant shoots and kills Aaron Feist? There were two rounds there. Six rounds uh, were fired on the second floor, and 61 rounds were fired on the third floor. 51 rounds were found, casings were found uh, in, the, in the third floor hallway, and 10 rounds were fired in uh, class, uh, teacher's lounge 1240. Uh, they found 10 casings, you know, the back part of the bullet. That's why I'm indicating this is what they found. As, as I said before, you know, when you fire a semi-automatic weapon, a semi-automatic rifle like this one, TF-162-14 is a serial number, the casing pops out when another round comes into the chamber for firing and it falls to the ground. That's how there were 17 casings on the first floor, two casings in the west stairwell, six casings on the second floor, 51 in the casings in the third floor hallway, and 10 casings in the, uh, the teacher's lounge. And of course, there's five bullet holes in the west window, and there's five bullet holes in the, in the south window. They also found the weapon, the gun, the 5.56 Smith & Wesson M&P 15. It was laying on the stairwell where the defendant left it. Still had a round in the chamber, and it had a magazine in it, and still had 23, 23 rounds in, in, in the magazine. And laying next to the gun, just as he left it, was the tactical vest. There were five magazines still in the pouches of the tactical vest. There was a 40 round magazine that was fully loaded with 40 rounds. And these 40 rounds, uh, all the rounds were either 5.56 or what, .223, because the defendant's 5.56 M&P 15 fires both 5.56 and .223. So there are 40 rounds in that one 40 round magazine in the tactical vest. There were four 30 round magazines still in the tactical vest. Four, uh, three of those four 30 round magazines were fully loaded with 30 rounds of either 5.56 or .223 ammunition. And there was the four 30 round magazine contained 29 rounds, not 30. They also found <coughs> magazines that were changed by the defendant, discarded after he was through. On the first floor, they found a 10-round empty magazine by his backpack. Remember, Nelt took off his backpack, changed the magazine. It was an empty 10-round magazine by his backpack. In that same hall, they found, hallway, they found an empty 30-round magazine. And all these magazines, by the way, hold both 5.56 ammunition and .223 ammunition. They found this empty 30-round magazine. Then they found another 30-round magazine in the first floor hallway that still had nine rounds in it, live rounds in it. On the third floor, in the hallway, they found an empty 30-round magazine in the hallway itself. And in, in the teacher's lounge, 1240, they found an empty 40-round 
magazine empty. This is what you know BSO found uh, when they were when they were there. You're going to see that there are seven aggravating factors applicable to this case. And before I get in get into that, Judge told you about the aggravating factors and weighing the weighing process. And remember I said it's a weighing process, it's not a counting process. So there are seven aggravating factors for you to consider. The first one is the defendant has previously been convicted of a capital felony or a felony involving the use or threat of the use of violence. That's one aggravating factor, and I'm going to talk about each one of these aggravating factors in a little bit. The second aggravating factor was the defendant knowingly created great risk of death to many people. That's number two. Number three, that the first degree murder, or in this case murders, don't forget there's 17 sentences. So I'm talking about them as there's one, there, there's 17. That the murders were especially heinous, atrocious, or cruel. Four, that the murders were cold, calculated, and premeditated. That the next one, the murders were done to disrupt or hinder a governmental function, to wit, schooling. The next one is that the victim was an appointed public official in the performance of their duties. Scott Beagle was a teacher. He was an appointed a public official. Christopher Hickson was an athletic director and a campus monitor. He was an appointed public official, as was Coach Spice. He was a coach and also a campus monitor. And the last one was that the murders were committed during the course of a burglary. You're saying burglary? Yeah, burglary. When the defendant entered that school without permission to commit an offense to wit murder, that's what a burglary is. And you can see that, let's take previous convictions. So, you can, even though they're not prior to uh, February the 14th, 2018, you can consider the murder of 16 other people, even though it's contemporaneous with the one. So if you have the murder of Gina Montaldo, you can use the murders of the other 16 victims as aggravators for that, for that, and would go for each other murdered victim, okay? And the 17 attempted murder in the first degree of the surviving victims, who I mentioned their names and they were shot, can aggravate each one of the sentences for the uh, deceased murder victims. And the other felony that you can consider, that on November the 13th, 2018, 10 months after the defendant was arrested, the defendant attacked a deputy, violently struggled and fought with him, took his taser, and there's a conviction for attempted battery on a law enforcement officer with a weapon. So they are in that, under that first aggravating factor of previously been convicted. Uh, you'll see the evidence will show that there was great risk, obviously, of death to many people. That the murders, all 17, were heinous, atrocious, and cruel. All 17 were cold, calculated, and premeditated. And that uh, the, um, to hinder and disrupt the school function, uh, he entered uh, the school, he shoots Scott Beagle and 
kills him. And Aaron Feist shoots him and kills him. Uh, the athletic director and campus monitor Christopher Hickson. Uh, they were appointed public officials. They were killed, uh, you know, to disrupt and hinder the school function. So there are the aggravating factors uh, that you you can consider in this case, and I submit to you have been proven be, will be proven beyond a reasonable doubt. And you'll see that these aggravating factors. And listen to, and I know you will, to all the evidence. Listen as carefully as you can, and I know you will. That these aggravating factors far outweigh any mitigating circumstances. Anything about the defendant's background, anything about his childhood, anything about his schooling, anything about his mental health, anything about his therapy, anything about his care, that the aggravating factors will outweigh any mitigating circumstances. After this was all over, uh, the police, uh, you know, went back and trying to do uh, as thorough an investigation as they possibly can. They uh, collected the defendant's backpack outside of classroom 1216. Uh, they collected this uh, Cabela black uh, case that he had carried his AR uh, type uh, rifle in. It was on the stairwell steps on the east stairwell. And laying about three feet away uh, from the Cabela bag with uh, earbud, earbuds still attached to this phone was the defendant's cell phone. 9504-821-1107. And the police did an extraction. And it took all the information from the phone. There were three cell phone videos. And the last one, and I'd said it before, the last one was on February the 11th, 2018. Hello, my name is Nick. I'm going to be the next school shooter of 2018. My goal is at least 20 people with an AR and some tracer rounds. I think I can get it done. It's going to be a big event. And when you see me on the news, you'll know who I am. You're all going to die. I, uh, I can't wait. Those words, those actions of killing 14 children, the athletic director, a coach, and a teacher, is why we're here today. Cold, calculative, manipulative, and deadly. At this time, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to take a 10-minute break. Please remember, do not discuss the case. Do not begin deliberating. And uh, we'll, again, a 10-minute break, and then we'll come back into court and, and finish our deal.